Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the parish of West Gordon, and welcome to our shared service of worship for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, A lot of familiar faces here um, and elsewhere. My name is Simon, Simon Crouch. Uh, A warm welcome, very warm welcome to our congregations in Strathdon and in Rhiney. And I very much hope that you're all keeping safe and well. It's lovely to see you. A warm welcome to any visitors that we have with us today. And also to any of our friends who are watching us online or catching up with the recording of the service later on. You're most welcome. So I do hope I'm coming through loud and clear Having tried our test service on the 11th of August, our three congregations are linked together by the wonders of technology. And I must say in advance a big thank you to Mike, to Paul and to Dick for making all this happen. The members of the Kirk session met the other night and agreed that this was the best way forward for our regular worship, at least for the time being. We're still going to hold our joint service on the first Sunday of the month when we all get together, all our congregations get together in one of our churches. Um, But for the time being, all other services of worship will be like this. Although I'll be leading worship from a different church every week. So I'm going to get a tour of the parish, which is lovely. Um, I'd also like to have a special mention to our congregation in Rhiney, who've had to agree yet again to another change of their service time um, from 11.30 to 10 o'clock. And unless you were able to change our friends in Rhiney, then this service would not be possible. So a huge thank you to you. Now there will be refreshments served in each church after the service, so I hope that many of you will be able to, to stay and have a time together. So this is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, which seems an awful long time ago. But we're also in the season of creation time. Now, creation time is a global joint ecumenical initiative. In in this year, creation time celebrates its 35th anniversary and is now a global initiative supported by the main Christian denominations right across the world. The European Christian Environmental Network has urged all churches to adopt creation time, keeping the environment and environmental issues high on the agenda, as we pray that our Creator God to guide us and inspire us as we work towards a more sustainable future, working in partnership with the natural world rather than against it. Each year, the Creation Time Steering Committee, made up of representatives from right across the various denominations agree on a theme for a season of creation. And this time it is to hope and act with creation. And that's based on the first fruits of hope taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which we'll be hearing later on. We're now actually officially in the third week of uh, uh, creation time, which covers the four Sundays in, Octo- in September plus the first Sunday in October. And that, of course, corresponds to the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. Now, our call to worship this morning fits in very well with the theme of praise to God for the wonders of creation. As usual, in our call to worship, I will say that the, the passages in italics, please join in with the passages in bold, please. The world is filled with the glory of God. Valleys are filled with colour. The vines and trees are filled with fruit, the fields with grain. We have food to put on the table. We offer our thanks. Because we have this community that loves us, we offer our thanks. Fill this place with our voices, singing and praising God. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. By your word, all things were created, each in its allotted space and time. You breathe life through your spirit, and in the whisper of the wind, we are reminded of your spirit's continual presence. The whole of creation declares your glory, Lord. A symphony of sound and color surround us. If we will, for just one moment, stand with eyes and ears attuned. 
The whole of humankind declares your glory, Lord. Each precious daughter or son, a unit of love in the currency of your family. Now in our worship we declare your glory. Proclaim your kingdom to the ends of the earth. Your love to the highest mountain. And your forgiveness to the depths of the sea. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. And let the distant shores rejoice. And in our first hymn. Um, which Jane very kindly is going to play for us. We join in our voices to praise to the Lord Almighty, the King of creation. readings for a Sunday service I look at a number of different translations and and I choose the one which I feel is the most meaningful for the theme which I am following on that particular service so for today's service I've chosen the new living translation which might not be everyone's favorite but I feel it adds a slightly different dimension to the meaning of the text So our first reading, using the New Living Translation, is Psalm 34, and we're going to read between us verses 11 to 19. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. You will want to live a life that is long and prosperous. Then keep your tongue from speaking evil, and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. 
search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. This person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to their rescue each and every time. Amen. Now, as part of the resources for creation time, the Ecumenical Committee have produced a creation liturgy. And as part of that, there is a response. I will say, merciful God, and the response is, sustain your planet and people in peace. Blessed God, who loves, calls the whole creation into covenant with you, and who puts in our hands responsibility for the care of the earth and its creatures. We pray for all to whom you have given life and being, saying, merciful God, sustain your planet and people in peace. For the well-being of the earth, for its resources of water, air, light, and soil, that they may be tended for the good of all creation, for the waters of the earth, for their careful use and conservation, that they will have the will and the ability to keep them clean and pure, for the mineral and energy resources of the planet, that we may learn sustainable consumption and sound care of the environment from which they come, for the animals of the earth, wild and domestic, large and small, that we and they may thrive in harmony with one another. For the creatures of the earth that do us harm, and those whose place in your creation we do not understand or welcome, that we may see them as your beloved creatures, we pray, merciful God, sustain your planet and people for all who shape public policies affecting the planet and its creatures, that they may consider wisely the well-being of all who come after us. For all those engaged in conservation, in agriculture, aquaculture and fishing, in mining and industry, and in forestry and timber harvesting, that the health, fruitfulness and beauty of the natural world may be sustained alongside human activity. For the creatures and the human beings of your world who are ill, or in danger, pain, or in special need, and for all who suffer from the unjust, violent, or wasteful use of the Earth's resources, or their devastation by war, that all may one day live in communities of justice and peace. We pray, merciful God, sustain your planet and people in peace. Guide us into harmony of relationship through loving kindness and the wise use of all that you have given us. For you are drawing all things into communion with you, Lord, and with each other, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Just before we did the, the, the liturgy, we uh, read together some verses from Psalm 34. Now, Psalm 34 was written by David, who at the time was running for his life away from Saul, who wanted to see him dead. So in fear of his life, David began his poem with Psalm 34, verse 1. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. And David remained faithful to God despite him fearing for his life. And God remained faithful to David as he had big plans for him. So David was seeking a peaceful life. But what is our definition of peace? Are we, are we all living a peaceful life? I'll turn it the other way around, a life full of peace. Somehow we think that peace should just come to us with no effort. But in Psalm 34, David explained that we are to seek and pursue peace and to work hard to maintain it. And in many ways, that is all down to each one of us. 
how we live our lives, and how we portray ourselves to others. A person who wants peace cannot be argumentative and contentious in any way. Like the old saying, of course, what goes around comes around. Peaceful relationships come from our efforts at peacemaking. As Christians, we should work hard at living in peace with others each and every day. So as well as working through some of our global themes of creation time, today we're going to be thinking about living in peace and how we reflect the peace of the living Christ in our own lives. And now I'm going to invite Margaret to lead us in our prayers of approach and of confession. Thank you. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise and worship you as our creator, as the source and sustainer of all life. Nothing exists apart from you. You are from everlasting to everlasting, dependent on nothing, self-existent. You are sovereign over all your creation. You created a universe beyond our imagining or understanding. Even as we find ways of exploring further into space, we know only a fraction of the vast number of stars and planets held in place by your all-powerful hands. You chose this small planet we call Earth to display your glory, a planet capable of sustaining life, a planet full of color and diversity, a planet full of living creatures. You created vast oceans, great mountain ranges, deserts and savannas. You created a diversity of plants, trees, flowers and shrubs. The oceans and seas are teeming with fish and sea creatures of incredible beauty. You created animals, insects and birds, all perfectly designed for their purpose, bound together in a variety of ecosystems. You created the sun to give us light and heat by day, the moon and the stars to illumine the night. You created the seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter. The yearly cycle of seed time and harvest is under your control. You cause the wind to blow where you will. You bring the rain or withhold it. You cause the sun to shine or hide it behind clouds. You bring the seeds to life. You create new life year after year. When we look around at our world, when we use all our senses to appreciate your creation, we cannot do anything but praise you and bow before you in awe and wonder. We thank you for the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, the clothes we wear. You are the provider and sustainer of all life. You created mankind to worship and glorify you and enjoy you. We give you thanks for all your blessings, but above all, we thank you for your steadfast love for your people. We thank you that you have provided a way for us who deserve your wrath, instead to receive your mercy. Gracious God, we have disobeyed your law and fallen under your judgment, but you sent your beloved Son to take on humanity to live the sinless life that we fail to live and to die on the cross, bearing the punishment for our sin, in order that those who believe are reconciled to you. Christ died so that our sins can be forgiven, so that the power of sin is defeated. He was the perfect sacrifice. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. Forgive us, Lord, that we still fall short of your perfect standard, that we say and do things which displease you, and we fail to be holy as you are holy. We fail to reflect your glory. We thank you that because Christ died for us, when we come to you with truly repentant hearts, you forgive our sins. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like red, like crimson, they shall become like wool. When we are forgiven, as far as east is from west, so far do you remove our transgressions from us. When we consider the cost of that forgiveness, we can only wonder at your grace and mercy, that you love us so much that Christ went willingly to the cross to redeem a people for himself. 
Forgive us, Father, that we often take your mercy for granted and fail to serve you as we should. Accept our worship this morning and hear us now as we join together in the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, now I'm going to invite Helen to read to us from Strathdon, um, from uh, Thess Thessalonians, I can't even say it, and the letter of James. The second reading is from the second book of Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit, who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the news of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, Stand firm and keep a strong grip on all the teachings which we passed on to you, both in person and by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing that you do and say. The third reading is from the Gospel of James, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, and then 17 to 18. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn whenever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Thanks be to God. It, it really is lovely to welcome you all into our churches today, whenever, wherever, and however you are worshipping with us today. You are all most welcome. With the retirement of John, we are, we've started a new chapter, if you like, in our parish, a new chapter in our book of life, so to speak. So what do we want to be remembered 
for? What would you like to be written in that book about us as a congregation? Seemingly like all of the main Christian denominations, we're faced with falling numbers of congregations, the possibility of closure of more of our church buildings. So as we've entered this new chapter, maybe it's time to just pause and take stock. How welcoming, welcoming are we as a church? How welcoming are we as a community of faith? Yes, we've become very familiar with each other, meeting in our churches every Sunday morning, seeing the same familiar faces. And I suppose in our own way, we're quite comfortable with that. But what happens when new people turn up? People who may just be passing through or just coming to see what faith is all about. How do we treat them and how do we welcome them? In our service in Rhiney last Sunday, we were joined by a number of German bikers who were just passing through. They're heading up to Inverness and on to the North Coast 500 route around the very top of Scotland. Now, as usual, I arrived in Rhiney by the skin of my teeth, just in time for the start of the, the service. And other than going up to them and quickly shaking their hands and saying, hi, good to see you, welcome, 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 I didn't get a chance to, to speak to them until after the service. And I've got to say what a lovely, really lovely group of guys they were. Nothing like the, the black leather jackets, the beards, the chains and the tattooed faces image that they were kind of given over. They were telling me that on their travels, wherever they go, they always factor in a stop in a church on a Sunday morning. And we were just lucky that Riney happened to be on the map. So I'm going to repeat the question which I asked earlier. How welcome we, welcoming are we? as a church? How welcoming are we as a community of faith, a community of believers? And just for us to think about, could we do better? Now since the 18th of August, the Sunday School have been looking at fruitfulness of the Spirit, which comes from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. So how's it been going? Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. I mean, you've, you've, uh, you've been looking at joy and love and joy, and today we're thinking about peace and patience. Now, I know you've had a couple of Sundays off, because obviously the first, the first Sunday was, uh, in, in the month was our final service for, for John and Alison, and then you had the guild service last week. As far as the rest of us are concerned, I thought that it would, I would remind us all what Paul wrote about the fruit of the Spirit. Again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's from Paul's letter to the, to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But I've included two more verses. So I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Now in the Psalm 34, uh, we, we looked at peace and the need to work at maintaining it. But what about patience? Are we a patient kind of person? Or do we expect everything to be done instantly? and get quite annoyed when it isn't. 
I must admit, when I ver- ver- visit the various schools, I do come across both types of people, those that are patient and those that are not. Towards the end of the school year, I do enjoy going along to the annual sports day. At Craigievar, for example, I seem to have taken on the role over the years of record keeper and helper for the team games. I'm also the awarder of the well done star you know, stickers for the, for the children that aren't, haven't been placed in the races. Now the children work in their, in their houses and I think from memory in Craigievar it's the foxes, the wildcats and the pine martins. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that one. And usually there's a team A and a team B as they go around the various activities. Points are awarded for each house. And of course then at the end of the sports day there's a real big way, well done so and so and well done so and so and whatever it is. The teams include the whole spectrum of the school, from P1s to P7s. And then sometimes the older children can get a wee bit impatient with their younger colleagues when they can't run as fast, or they keep dropping things, or they can't catch the ball, or whatever it happens to be. As we know, the problem is that lack of patience can turn to frustration which in turn can lead to angry words. And I'm sure we've all seen that and possibly been been experienced to that at some time. So how important is patience in our fast-paced, instant, 21st century society? You only have to drive along one of our many country roads at a a pace which you deem to be reasonable for the road conditions, just to see in your wing mirrors a car itching to get past at the very first opportunity. No patience. I love this, this saying from the book of Proverbs. It's Proverbs 25, 15. Patience can persuade a prince and soft speech can break bones. So thinking about peace and patience. Think about that question again. How welcoming are we as a church? I know you're going to look at patience, uh, peace and patience in Sunday school. So as I'm not going anywhere today, it'll be lovely to have a chat with you afterwards and see what you've all come up with in there. But when we're thinking about peace and how we reflect peace the peace of Christ in our lives. Let's ask God to make us a channel of that peace so that we can spread it, spread peace, and make peace with all who we meet. So we stand and sing that beautiful uh, hymn based on the words of St. Francis of Assisi. It's number 528 in the hymn book, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
nice as well. Are you good, Hamish? Yeah, well done. Yeah. I shall see you all later on, eh? Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, this is the third Sunday of the season of creation time. And each year, the steering committee chooses a theme based on a reading from the Bible. And this year, the theme is to hope and act with creation, which is based on the first fruits of hope, uh, which is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. So I'm just going to read out the passage. Romans 8, verses 19 to 25. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And there again is another reference to patience. It is a passage, and I, th I feel actually with a lot of Paul's letters, it is something that you have to read two or three times to really get the, 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 the message of there. So possibly, you know, to say, take, with all our readings today, take the uh, orders of service away with you and have a, a wee look over a cup of coffee at home. According to the Creation Time Steering Committee, the globally shared context of urgent and accelerating threat from the crisis of nature and climate, of which Scotland has experienced some, in the exceptional storm season of last winter, the torrential rains of the spring, it's prompting churches around the world to attend to the emissions in their official calendars and adopt, according to their local and particular church customs, a season of prayerful and active engagement with our relationship with the earth and fellow creatures. Now, a large part, of course, of the season of creation time is raising awareness, making us think and look about creation and what we do. And what we do, you know, in our own lives to be more sustainable uh, and to use the resources that we are given by God more creatively um, and without waste. And it is within our thoughts and prayers. And as Margaret said in her prayers of approach, you know, we're all part of creation together. We'll hear in the notices later on, which Phyllis is going to read out to us, our Eco Congregation Steering Group will be meeting here in Afford tomorrow evening at 7.30. If you are a member of the group, please come along. If you're not a member of the group, but you would like to, to think about it and join us and, and see how we can all work together, then please feel free to, to come along. It would be lovely to see you. Now, Helen read out to us earlier a select section of the letter from the Apostle James. Is James somebody that we know much about? Is it one that we read very often? I think it's a wonderful letter, James. Now, it's widely accepted that James was not one of Jesus' closest disciples, Remember, one of the disciples, James, the brother of John. No, it wasn't him. But this was James, the half-brother of Jesus. James was not a follower of Jesus during his, the Savior's time on earth, but eventually became an apostle, very much like Paul. 
as one who had seen and believed in the Lord following his appearance after his resurrection. James himself became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And Paul called him, in many of his letters, one of the pillars of the church. James was speaking to a very close and intimate community in his own church in Jerusalem. Yet the danger of unguarded words within it had to be recognized. And of course the message of James has a much wider scope of influence which transcends all the generations. And it has as much relevance within our community today as it did more than 2,000 years ago. The letter of James is written very much like a, a workshop manual for what a Christian is all about. And if you were ever had anybody who was thinking about being a Christian, was new at being a Christian, thought, well, how is it all about? How do we behave? How do we act? Then point them to the letter of James right the way through. He wrote it to expose hypocritical practices and to teach, teach right and proper Christian behavior. He writes about dealing with trials and tribulations, about acting out our faith, not just saying we believe, but doing something about it. Action speaks much larger, um, stronger than words. About listening before speaking, and about exercising self-control and treating everyone with equity and fairness. Now surely that, for us, as our community of faith should be how we live our lives, how we are seen, how we welcome and are portrayed to others. At the start of chapter 3, he probably writes about the most difficult type of self-control, taming the tongue, as he calls it, which was as much of a problem in the first century as it is today. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? We've all said, oh yeah, you know, hindsight. I'm sure that most, if not all of us, have said something in the past which has caused hurt or anger, provoked an, an unhelpful emotional response, or caused division, which has put a strain on or even broken up relationships. How we wish that we could just wind back time and unsay that particular thing. Or modify our response perhaps, or be a bit more understanding, which we weren't at the time. And in my mind, there's nothing more untrue than the old saying which says, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Wrong. Broken bones can be healed, Whereas divisions caused by an unguarded word can last a lifetime. What we say is very powerful and can have a dramatic effect. What we say can be really beautiful, really helpful, really comforting at times of stress. Or it can be really horrible. It can build someone up or it can practically destroy them. Today's technology makes our words even more powerful as we can send a message all over the world at the touch of a button. And once that message has been sent, it's out of our control. Very sadly, we've seen and heard and read about situations where an unguarded word has caused somebody somewhere to think differently and even take their own lives. James reminds his listeners that controlling, thinking about what we say is vital. A careless spark, as he says, can destroy a whole forest. So when we were thinking about peace and patience, which we were just before the, the, the Sunday school left, I asked the question, how welcoming are we? How welcoming are we? as a church. As Christians we are charged with living in peace and in harmony with one another. And most importantly, 
the great, great Commission, of spreading the word of God and encouraging others into faith. How good are we at doing that? I mentioned at the very start of our service that we're entering a new chapter of our development as a parish here in West Gordon. Now, going back a few years in, um, in our former parish of Upper Donside, we did a lot of work a few years ago affirming our identity. And I'm going to borrow, just for a minute, the tagline which we came up with as part of that exercise. The tagline that we came up with was a welcoming church in the heart of the community. A welcoming church in the heart of the community. And surely that's what we here in West Gordon want to be seen as. Last week in my service, I asked a question, which again got us thinking about how relevant is faith in our 21st century Scotland? And if it isn't relevant, what can we do about it? We want not only to be seen as relevant, but we want to be seen as interesting. A place where people can come to experience faith and hear about the benefits of living a life of faith. I would suggest that we want to be seen here in West Gordon as a place where the love of God is shown in action. Where people are encouraged and want to, want to come in and see us and explore what faith is all about. We all know, do we not, that journey, um, faith is seen as a journey. And at various points of that journey, we join in. And we see where we're going to go on to. Some, some bits are relevant to us. Some bits are not relevant to us. Some bits mean something to us. Other bits not perhaps. So we look into it a bit further. But our responsibility as a community of faith is encourage those people to develop their faith. To come together. To worship like this. And learn from one another. We want to be seen as a community where people are treated with care. And respect. A place where questions are answered and faith developed. We talked earlier about the Sunday school looking at the fruitfulness of the Spirit. And again, just to remind us, Galatians 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. So what sort of fruit can we produce in the lives of others? My friends, we have a, an ideal opportunity, as I said earlier, to, to pause and take stock. See where we are, where we want to go, and what we have to do to get there. Here in West Gordon, we want to be seen as a, a welcoming, vibrant community of faith, always reaching out to others. Filled by the Holy Spirit, we want to be seen as a place where the love of God can be seen and experienced by the way that we all live our lives. And with that in mind, I've chosen our next hymn, where we invite the Holy Spirit to come amongst us, to guide us forward, and to fill us all with the living water of faith. Stand and sing together at number 722. Spirit of God, come dwell within me. And if I could ask for the offering to be brought forward, please.
now I'm going to invite Janet to lead us all in prayer. Our gifts are small, Lord, compared to the vastness of creation that you have provided for us. But they are given with love and gratitude to help the building of your glorious kingdom here on earth. Help us to be generous givers with our money, with our talents, and with our time. Amen. Now, prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Thank you, sustaining God, for clouds rolling across the sea and land, freedom and space to explore, the soothing pattern and rhythm of our days. The season grounds us in the eternal. Tranquility in early morning rising, delight in green surroundings, joyous laughter of children. Remind us of the wonders of our lives, and we give thanks for the gifts we witness around us in green spaces, in music and creativity, support, validation, and love in companionship, our church communities. Thank you, sustaining God, for clouds rolling across the sea and land, freedom and space to explore the soothing pattern and rhythm of our days and seasons ground us in the eternal tr tranquility of early morning rising. The wisdom of our shared heritage and the wonderful example of Jesus. Thank you, sustaining God. Sun shining low on the horizon, warning, warming the shortened autumn days. Gardens and parks come blazes of colour, trees and earth preparing to rest, rejuvenate, restore for next year. We give thanks for a season's gifts, welcome nourishment for body and soul, and acknowledge the movement of time in phases of life and death. We pray for all who are charged with creating change, change in attitude, understanding, priorities, intent for political leaders to hold true to their calling as carers of our world. That all responsible for environmental decisions can see beyond immediate economic concerns, creating a vision for a shared world order enabling an environment of hope and speak for earth, for the burden of responsibility to be, be communal and all harmful agendas to be shelved. We lift up before God the young, the vulnerable in every community, all in positions of trust, remembering all who tend earth and animal sustaining our existence through food and those who nourish our emotional lives in friendship, family companionship, laughter and joy. We give thanks. We honour individuals who have shaped our pattern and understanding of worship, saints, martyrs, mystics, whose insights we value, whose examples we honour. We bring silent prayers of our own burdens, both those of love and those which lie heavily upon our hearts. We pray for those who have died that they might rise to eternal life and that we may so live on earth that we are all prepared for meeting God in our lives. Amen. Uh, I'm now going to invite Phyllis.
to take us through all our notices for today. Copies of the prayer diary for the month of September are now available, so please take a copy with you. Once again, thank you to Alison Hunter for putting it all together. The second edition of our parish newsletter is now available in all churches, plus in local shops and garages. If you haven't already had a copy, then please take one for yourself. And if you are aware of anyone who would be interested in catching up on our news, but might not be able to come along to our services, please take extra copies. The next meeting of the Monday Coffee Club is tomorrow, uh, Monday the 16th of September. The Monday Coffee Club meets in St. Don Church Hall from 10.15 to 12.30. All are welcome to come along for tea, coffee, juice and a fine piece and a good blether. The Eco Congregation Group will meet tomorrow evening, Monday the 16th at 7.30pm in the meeting room in Alford Church Hall. All are welcome. The Silver Circle, the St. Don Bay's group for senior citizens, cordially invite the community to a harp recital by the Scalty Harp Group at 1.30pm on Wednesday the 18th of September at the Lonach Hall, St. Don. Admission is by donation only. All are welcome. There will be a buttery morning to be held from 10am to 12pm in number 14, the Square Rhiney, on Saturday the 21st September in aid of Macmillan Cancer Support. Entry, adult £3 and children one hundred and fifty. And there will also be a raffle and bottle stall. Donations gratefully received. The parish are once again supporting the Blycewood Care Shoebox Appeal, transforming lives from Christian care by filling a shoebox with simple things you can bring hope this Christmas. Our local coordinator is Jean Mortimer, who can be contacted by phone. Uh, the numbers are on your notices that you've got with your order of service and the filled shoe boxes are due to be collected at some point during the last week of October. Please give generously and spread some joy this Christmas. Our service next Sunday 22nd of September will be another shared service of worship and will be held at 10 a.m. in Afford, St. Dawn and Rhiney Churches but this time the worship will be led from Rhiney Church. The Acorn Road Show will be holding a meeting in Fountain Hall Church, Queen's Cross, Aberdeen on Thursday 26 September from 7 to 8.45 with Acorn National Director Paul Harringham the simplest way of following God in mission. Find out why this practice is reviving churches all over the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I, I was made aware actually of another notice this morning, which I didn't know anything about. Um, apparently, the, the Guild meet tomorrow um, at 2.30. And the uh, theme, I think, Jeannie was saying, is let us all eat cake. Well, we're all going to be eating cake soon, but let us eat cake tomorrow. That'd be lovely. So, uh, Guild meeting tomorrow at 2.30, plus the AGM, I believe. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much indeed. So, many thanks for joining us for our first of our shared services of worship, the third Sunday of creation time. Many thanks to James for playing for us. Thank you very much indeed, James. To Helen for reading, to Margaret, Janet and Phyllis for helping with the service. And a big thank you to Mike, Dick and Paul for dealing with all the technical issues. Uh, I would like to say that it all seems to be, yeah, brilliant. So thank you all very much. Oh, no, that's absolutely fine. It's, we, we can't manage without it. It's just lovely. And I do hope that you'll be able to stay behind for refreshments. Afford and Strathdon, the refreshments will be served in the church hall in Rhiney. The uh, refreshments are going to be in the church. So many thanks in advance to anybody that's supplied or serving refreshments in any of our three churches. Now, our benediction today has been prepared by the Eco Congregation Scotland in line with the weekly theme for creation time. And as we've been reflecting on the peace of God, before we leave our worship today, we're going to ask for the God of peace to go with us. As we sing together at the very end of the service, may the God of peace go with us, which is number 786 in the hymn book. But our final hymn, we echo the themes of creation time as we sing praises to our, our, our almighty creator. Praise the Lord, you heavens adore him, which is number 139.
every glance to the skies above, with every step on the soil below, with every choice that cares and changes, may you bless and be blessed with joy and hope. And the blessing of the sustainer, the Christ and the wild wind, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and in you and for you and those who you love now and forevermore until the very end of the age.